framers of the Constitution of the United States made no provision in the governmental structure for the functioning of political parties because they believed that parties were a source of corruption and an impediment to the freedom of people to judge issues on their merits. James Madison argued in his Federalist Paper No. 10 against a system in which factions, his word for parties, might be able to seize control of the government. The Washington cabinet epitomized the ideal and respectable mode of politics which was conducive to the maintenance of a single party system. But this was an idealistic illusion which was short-lived and was soon shattered by the exigencies of rising trends of the time. Referring to this trend, Richard Hofstadter has shown that in spite of not mentioning political parties in the US Constitution and that most of the founders held strongly anti-party views, organized and enduring parties soon became an integral part of the American political landscape. D.W. Brogan is, however, of the opinion that the division which appeared in the American party system was the outcome of the Jefferson-Hamilton conflict which finally led to the creation of two parties. Describing this conflict, Professor Palit has shown that the basic contradictions between Hamilton and Jefferson were on state rights versus federal rights, the strengthening of the financial network, tariff policy, and in the field of foreign policies. Alexander Hamilton was the Secretary of Treasury and Thomas Jefferson was the Secretary of State in the first ever cabinet held by George Washington, the first president. Now, both these people were friends, but they had different opposite political views. Alexander Hamilton believed in a strong center, diminution of state rights, strong federal structure, and a pro-British foreign policy. Whereas, Thomas Jefferson believed in a soft center, preservation of state rights, and a pro-French foreign policy. But George Washington thought that both had huge experience on their side. Therefore, they could be put into the same cabinet. He wanted to get the best out of them for nation building purpose. Now, George Washington was a very able statesman. He could really bring out the best in these two personalities in the interest of the nation. So, but, uh, yes. the controversy between uh, Hamilton and Jefferson, it was personal or it was only uh, the national issues? Yeah, this, uh, this pers the, the personal culture has been too much highlighted in many American history textbooks. But if you take my point of view, I would say that personal issues didn't matter. They were very good friends outside. And the, uh, if we consider the founding fathers of the American Republic, both have to be named together. So from that point of view, it was not a personal conflict at all. But ideological conflict, yes. They differed widely. Uh, amongst themselves. Jefferson uh, vouched for those things which he thought was in the best interest of the country. And Hamilton also felt that whatever he was championing was for the good of the country. Therefore, the conflict was not personal. It was ideological, but not also dogmatically ideological. Both were nationalists in a way. And national interest was the main draw for them. The second issue that led to contradictions between Hamilton and Jefferson was the strengthening of the financial network. Now, Alexander Hamilton believed that there should be a strong Federal Bank of the United States, that there should be a strong tariff policy for ingress and egress of goods from America and to America, and uh, suitable excise duties etc. Thomas Jefferson, though it was not his portfolio, he was not a very well-known financial manager. Nevertheless, he opposed this idea of 
too much of power in the hands of the Bank of United States or the Secretary of Treasury for that matter. He was also opposed to strong tariff policy, tariff walls. He was also opposed to local excise duties of any kind. He thought that the central interference should be minimum and states should have some concurrent rights for in the matter of taxation. The next are differences over foreign policies. Thomas Jefferson had been an ambassador to Paris uh, prior to his appointment as Secretary of State and Alexander Hamilton had been to London as ambassador to UK and he actually had that kind of experience and basically he he was an Anglophile. Alexander Hamilton wanted to uh, copy Westminster as far as possible whereas Thomas Jefferson would have the French model of democracy. So these are wide differences, these are wide differences and uh, George Washington as I had already said took the best of both and the government had a st fairly strong center, a federal government at that but nevertheless there was accommodation for state rights as well and the Bank of the United States was created, it controlled money matters very much but then it was put under a restraint by Thomas Jefferson's intervention. Some tariff policies were there and here uh, Alexander Hamilton carried the point. So also about excise duty, here also Hamilton scored over Thomas Jefferson. As to foreign policy, at least during the first cabinet and subsequently we know that USA followed a pro-British foreign policy and not so much a pro-French foreign policy at that. So lines were drawn, lines were drawn, the differences were uh, clear and therefore uh, it was predictable that after Washington was gone, American political system would undergo a drastic change, there would be the emergence of political parties. After Washington's term was over, we find that Thomas Jefferson was heading a party which he called Democratic Republican Party and naturally his opponent Alexander Hamilton also had John Jay on his side, James Madison on his side, many other people who came to be known as Federalists. So Americans had two parties then, one was the Democratic Republican Party led by Thomas Jefferson and the other was the Federalist Party led by Alexander Hamilton. Two parties were born. In 1796, Adams was chosen to succeed Washington as president, winning over Thomas Jefferson and Thomas Pinckney. After coming to power in around the 1790s, Adams diligently towed the decisions of Washington. John Adams was a Federalist. He was coming from Boston, a lawyer, one of the framers of the Constitution, ardent follower of Alexander Hamilton. So whatever Hamilton had vouched for was equaled by John Adams. John Adams was also an Anglophile. He also a strong Federalist and he also wanted the financial institutions to be strengthened by all means and state rights he thought was anarchy so he would cuttle state rights wherever it was possible uh, enlarge the powers of the federal government so that was uh, John Adams and during John Adams' time therefore the Federalist Party actually uh, flourished it went on flourishing I was taken for granted that for some time then this party would continue but in between, Thomas Jefferson had become the third president. Thomas Jefferson was the president of America for two terms, 1801 to 1805 and 1805 to 1809. During his tenure, actually, tables were turned. 
He undid whatever John Adams had done. He was pursuing a policy where federal rights were minimal and he cuttled the power of uh, the Bank of United States and promoted the state rights in the state conventions. Wherever there were state assemblies, much power was given over to them and there was no intervention from the center into state matters. And he was pursuing a pro-French foreign policy by and large and would rather have a showdown, a naval showdown with the British. That was his policy. And he had a master triumph in purchase of Louisiana in 1803. Louisiana was a French territory which Napoleon wanted to give up at a huge price, $45 million or so. Jefferson purchased Louisiana from Napoleon and with this uh, he built up the Democratic Republic of the United States even better than before. For the sum of money the territory was much more precious and it added strength to the American democracy and Jefferson was immensely popular. So at this stage we can say that there is a virtual eclipse of Federalist Party and spectacular rise of Democratic Republican Party under Jefferson during his two terms. At this stage, Jefferson could not really uh, make it a mass-based party because Jefferson himself came from a very aristocratic landed family. Jefferson was a, not a man of the mass. Theoretically, he identified with the masses, no doubt about that. He was a democrat to the core. It became a mass democracy under Andrew Jackson. He himself, you know, was a man of the frontier. He came from Middle West and he had good contact with the Middle West. So when he became president on the uh, Jeffersonian ticket, that is Democratic Republican Party's ticket, when he became president, he immediately declared he would have that kind of a uh, government of the common people. That was the main thrust in his uh, manifesto. And he really brought these sections uh, into play under his government. So he really uh, created what can be called a mass democracy. And therefore, your question I take now that Jackson uh, was a champion of a democratic Republican Party, which was truly a mass-based party for the first time. Other parties before him were not mass-based. Jackson's Democratic Party was the forerunner of today's Democratic Party. Alexis D. Tocqueville, in his book Democracy in America, based on his journey in 1831, highlights the mass popular politics responsible for the Democratic Party. Nicholas Biddle, the President of the Bank of the United States, raised a splinter group of the Democratic Republican Party named National Republican Party against Andrew Jackson. The National Republican Party was the party of the die-hard blue-blood aristocrats. Nicholas, with his money power, tried to manipulate the election to defeat Jackson, but couldn't succeed. In that race, ultimately, Jackson won, and the National Republicans cut a sorry figure. And after this defeat, the Federalists, or the new incarnation of Federal Republicans, were virtually wiped out. The complete triumph of Jacksonian democracy in American politics is to be seen in the replacement of the cliquish Republican Party in the 1830s. The Whigs, unlike Republicans, were Jacksonian in style. As America ventured across the Mississippi and tried to carve out new space for the nation at the cost of its neighbor Mexico, settlers established a new republic in Texas in 1836. The hunger for new land was further accentuated by the discovery of gold in California and drew the Americans to the Wild West. The question of inclusion of these lands in the American Union 
became more prominent after the Mexican War. The status of inclusion of the new states was hotly debated, that is, whether they were to be included as slave states or free states. It was over this question that the parties were divided. A shift was noticeable in the American political system during this period. The earlier debate on state rights versus federal rights was replaced by the question of slavery. This might look as a genuine move towards humanitarian issues. But on hindsight, as well as closer scrutiny, this act appears as a purely economic and political move. But sir, uh, which, which factor was strong be, behind the movement, slavery movement? Uh, economy or human rights? To my mind, as a student of American history, it was an economic question. It was not so much a humanitarian a human rights question. They were not so much bothered about human rights as, uh, as a whole. It was, it, it was basically freedom versus slavery. And free economy versus slave economy. North economy of the North was industrial uh, economy. They depended on free labor. They couldn't compete with slave-based economy of the South. Uh, if that slave-based economy invaded the North, then that would completely cripple northern industrial uh, economy based on free labor. So the economic conflict was one of the basic issues in it. So it's not so much of uh, human rights for which they were fighting. To, they were try fighting to preserve their own kind of economy. North wanted to enshrine their uh, industrial economy. The South wanted to enshrine their plantation economy based on slavery. Both sides wanted to extend their jurisdiction into the other. So North wanted to go to South, South wanted to go to North. So that was the fundamental conflict. Groups developed around the slavery question and each of these began to advance patronage to the political parties. William Lloyd Garrison raised public opinion against slavery by calling it unconstitutional and led an anti-slavery society for the barn burner party. David Christie emerged as the leader of a pro-slavery society. They considered slaves as an inviolable property by the private property theory. So these are also chips in the same block. They are not directly parties, but they fan the fire. The Missouri Compromise sought to solve these problems amicably. Compromises were made between the pro- and anti-slavery parties and a line was agreed upon at the 36 degree 30 minute as the demarcation between free and slave states. In 1860, another compromise had to be made as both sides flouted the Missouri Compromises, quarreled over how to integrate the territory one from Mexico into the United States. This time it was ruled that for every slave state included in the Union, a free state also would have to be included. There should be an equilibrium in the American Congress and Senate. So that was the idea. So all the time the matching game was going on. If one state would be born slave, the other state would be free. In this way, a delicate balance was being made. But this couldn't work out for a long time. You don't get always a matching uh, state formation. Sometimes it may be two to one. It would not be exactly in pairs all the time. You cannot get that kind of statehood. So that was not the solution. It was simply, we can say, shelving the question. But a time came by 1860 that some decision had to be taken in the life of the nation. Whether it would be free, whether it would also carry slaves, whether it would be industrial economy or whether it would, be, it would remain perpetually agrarian. But in the name of the constitution we know that life, liberty and pursuit of happiness are to be preserved. But slave was a property. Technically slave was also a property because it is, it is out of buying and selling that slaves come. So property could be taken anywhere. anywhere. But somehow pursuit of happiness was not just property. So for, in the good of the, uh, for the good of the country, 
uh, slavery had to be abolished. That was the argument uh, of the National Republicans. The new name taken by Ab Abraham Lincoln's party on the eve of 1860. And Abraham Lincoln fought from National Republican platform, which was opposed to slavery, they wanted to abolish slavery in the manifesto of the party also. It was clearly mentioned, if Lincoln wins, slavery goes, that kind of thing. Once Lincoln was elected as the next president, the southern states decided to declare secession from the Union out of insecurity. Under such duress, Lincoln was forced to pass the Emancipation of Slavery Act in 1863 and send federal troops to suppress the rebel states of the South and bring them back into the fold of the Union. Sir, what did Lincoln's victory signify for post-Civil War America? Well, this victory, that is, his victory and the uh, suppression of the secession of the uh, rebel states of the South and abolition of slavery meant a free America was born. And there was no turning back from that date. So this victory, Lincoln's victory, and his achievement of the double would mean that America was not going to remain agricultural America, pastoral America, it was surely going to emerge as an industrial America. That is the message his victory meant. The party system after the American Civil War became more pronounced and active in American politics. Civil society now depended on the steady and fruitful debates of the party system.